The Truth Can Get You Killed, a Paul Turner mystery. Author, Mark Richard Zubro, publisher, St. Martin's Press, New York. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 6. Judge Wadsworth lived on Lakeshore Drive in a luxury high-rise apartment just north of Erie Street. He'd offered to meet them, however, in his chambers in the new Kennedy Federal Building, just north of Congress Parkway, at the south end of the loop and only a few blocks from Aunt Millie's. He could gain them entrance to inspect Judge Meade's office. The red steel and glass structure was across from the new Cook County Jail. The brand new Kennedy Federal Buildings was something of a joke among Chicagoans. Every once in a while, a public building went up and was plagued with glitches. The state of Illinois' building had huge problems with heating and air conditioning, among numerous others. From rats in the offices to leaks in the roof, the less than two-year-old Kennedy building had come in for lots of criticism. One of the funnier headlines had been on the need to replace all the doorknobs in the building. Someone had ordered them all a half-size too small. The rumor was that the architect was living luxuriously in Tahiti. The judge met them at the security desk, and they took the elevator to the 10th floor. The judge's chamber was all blonde wood, maroon leather, and bookcases crammed with books. He had a window that looked east over the Harold Washington Library, to Lake Michigan, south on Dearborn, and even a little west to the Midwest Stock Exchange, a building which bridged the parkway. The judge was a tall, slender, handsome man in his early 60s, wearing blue jeans and a, a white fisherman sweater. He greeted them gravely. After they were seated, he said, This is a tragedy. We haven't had a federal judge murdered in years. I don't know if we ever have. This is awful. He was a good judge. Was he? Fenwick asked. Wadsworth's responding look was not hostile. He said, I think carefully about all the people who work in this jurisdiction. I make it a practice never to criticize my fellow jurist. Certainly not after they're dead. Meaning there was something to criticize about Meade, Fenwick asked. Well, that is certainly not what I meant, Wadsworth said. I speak very precisely. My words mean exactly what they say. None of us is perfect. Have you not made poor decisions or committed blunders? You later regretted. We didn't get murdered last night, Fenwick said. Turner noted that Judge Wadsworth paused before each sentence. His face clear and unlined in repose, crinkled from mouth to chin, whether frowning or trying to smile. The crinkling occurred before the beginning of each statement. A message of superiority, wisdom, thoughtfulness, and great weight was given to his every utterance. We need to know the dynamics of the court here, Turner said. Somebody was angry enough to kill him. Not anybody here. This was a group of men and women who took their job seriously. These were people who knew they were given grave responsibilities and who worked hard to fulfill them. I'm sure none of them is guilty of any transgression. Didn't his rabid conservatism antagonize his fellow jurists? Fenwick asked. No, you can look through all his decisions, examine the record, you'll see that he was with the majority more often than not. He was not isolated or alone. He had friends here. What about the public attacks on him? And there is often controversy following our rulings. When you are in our position, you have to expect that. Attacks are part of the job. Certainly no one presumes there will be physical danger. Nobody made an attempt on the life of a Supreme Court judge over Roe v. Wade or the subsequent decisions connected to that case. But people have died because of that issue. Not judges. Wadsworth was not aware of any personal animosities among the jurists, clerks, and other employees. Nor did he know of any family troubles Mead might have had. In answer to their questions... Wadsworth claimed he was at a political fundraiser most of the afternoon, and then drove home with his wife, and subsequently spent a quiet evening with her. And they got the names and addresses of the people who worked closely with Judge Mead. If they had time, they'd get them today at home. 
If not, most would be in to work tomorrow. Wadsworth called one of the security guards and, with him, accompanied them to Meade's office. With bringing Mrs. Meade down to make positive identification, they hadn't had time to inspect any papers at Meade's home to see if they were significant or not. The security guard opened the door. Judge Wadsworth stood in the entrance. He said, I'll leave you the security guard. We'll be outside the door in case you need anything. And to watch, so they didn't steal the silver, Turner thought. Fenwick's first comment after the door shut behind them was, Knowing my public servants are so perfect and dedicated sure cheers me up. I'm comforted that uh, they got along so well. Can't have been that much sweetness and light. There had to be disagreements. We'll have to check all these people as well as Meade's recent cases. We better see if we can get some researchers started. Reading those things, the room in more maroon leather, blonde wood, and bookcases crammed with books. The only difference between this room and Judge Wadsworth's was it had a south and west corner view. From this office, you could see the top half of the Sears Tower. Fenwick took down a few of the books at leisure. All the judges' offices I've ever been in or seen on television have these rows of books. I wonder if they ever really opened them. A Turner shrugged. One door led off to the darkened courtroom, and another was a pristine, clean bathroom, complete with shower and fresh towels. This was so he could clean up after a hard day of judging, Fenwick asked. I guess. Turner opened the medicine cabinet and gazed inside. Fenwick said, Just once, I'd like to open one of these and have it make a difference in a case. Nothing in the bathroom was remotely suspicious. They sifted carefully through the documents strewn on top of the judge's desk. After several minutes of skimming through one document, Fenwick began to sing, Clues, glorious clues. Find something? No, just aimlessly humming. You were singing, and you were using words. Singing, words. Humming, no words. I'm beginning to worry about you, Buck. You've been singing Broadway show tunes a lot lately. And learning the basics of color and fabric. I think it's just a phase. You see an appointment book. Fenwick shook his head. Turner glanced at the family picture on the desk. In it, the judge still had all his hair. The family was in a woods or a very large backyard having a picnic. They all sat around a table with a red checked tablecloth. Besides the judge and his wife, there was a girl about eight or nine and a boy about four or five. And they started through the drawers after 20 minutes of paper clips, pens, papers, and a paperback novel of Barbara Diamato's Hard Christmas. They had nothing helpful in the murder investigation. Fenwick slammed the bottom drawer shut and said, uh, Plenty of nothing. Stop that, Turner said, or I'll tell Carruthers. And they left. Judge Rosemary Malmstead, assistant chief judge, was next on their list. She lived in the western suburb of Oak Brook and had not been willing to drive into the city. Using their map, they quickly arrived at her substantial tri-level home on Apple Street. They heard a football game on in a distant living room as she led them into a sitting room. In one corner sat a chest of drawers. Scenes of Paris. A leather sofa and matching love seats with chrome accents were placed around a glass-top coffee table. This last rested on top of a Chinese deco carpet. Judge Malmstead wore baggy black jeans, a flannel sweater, and black leather boots. Turner said, well, We talked to Judge Wadsworth about Judge Meade, and we'll be talking to all your colleagues. Our esteemed leader told you everything was wonderful, didn't he? That everyone worked together like a family. Not precisely. He did say y'all got along. She gave a low, mirthless laugh. <laughs> He's wrong. What can you tell us? Fenwick asked. I can tell you my perceptions. I don't think there was enough wrong to drive someone to murder, but my information might give you places to go. People to talk to and angles to think about. Which is the point of an investigation, isn't it? A Turner and Fenwick nodded. I've been on the bench here for two years. I was appointed by a Democrat. 
Meade was one of Nixon's last appointees. Made it to the bench as a young man. I believe his family made fairly substantial contributions to Republican coffers, as did mine, to Democrats, before I was elevated to the bench. Judges don't like to talk about such things, but it is the truth. A cheer erupted from the distant television. She poked her head out the door. Turn that down, Ernie, she called, then returned to her seat. You will discover from those of us on the bench in Chicago who are honest that I hated him. Turner and Fenwick simply kept giving her their best. The witness is talking, and I'm going to listen, faces. You don't act surprised. Should we be? Turner asked. She shrugged. I don't think any of the others had as much animosity between them as he and I. At least, they never expressed it as much as the two of us did. I am considered the most liberal of the judges. Meade was the most conservative. In our meetings, we were always on the opposite side. It would have been different if he was arguing from logical and sensible theories, philosophies, or beliefs. He was just a hater, a blind bigot. The hatred was mutual. Oh, yes. Everybody saw it at least once. A Judge Wadsworth. Of course. He did, the old hypocrite. He's big on decorum, secrets, and the old boy network. I wish he'd retire and die. Either one works for me. That worked for you in terms of Judge Mead? She smiled. I was speaking rhetorically, not making a statement of intent or describing an action taken. Where were you last night? Fenwick asked. Here. We had a family gathering that lasted until two in the morning. My mother and father were in town vacationing for the holidays. We were up around seven this morning. Tell me about his conservative decisions, Turner said. Think of all the issues of the day. Abortion, gay rights, affirmative action, drug testing, redistricting. If he had his way, every woman would be pregnant, tested for drugs, not allowed to vote, and married to a man who was the only one in the house, out earning an income. He antagonized a lot of groups, Fenwick asked. Well, he wasn't as prominent a conservative as, say, a Phyllis Schlafly or a Pat Buchanan, but... In his own way, he had more impact than they ever did. Our decisions often have an immediate, direct impact on those involved. Anyone's in particular come to mind? Of course, the latest was the upholding of the anti-gay law in DuPage County. Before that, I'd have to check dates and decisions. He's been around a long time. He's got a paper trail you'll have to follow. Although he didn't write a lot of the decisions. Who did? He was a hater, but he wasn't too bright. Whoever was on the bench and could be articulate about his position would write the decision. Did he prevail often? We've been getting a little more liberal sometimes. He won, sometimes he lost. I'd say in the past few years he'd lost more than one. Mostly because he was so stupid. People were getting fed up with him. Just being negative and inarticulate. Other than disagree with you... Could he actually cause you problems? Like what? Try and lose your, your job. Mead would threaten and bluster, but that kind of thing doesn't really happen. There is a judicial review that the chief judge runs, but it is a very secret and very unknown. We do have a good behavior clause, but in essence, we serve for life. All the judges could get together and recommend someone be fired, but... I've never heard of it happening. More likely, people would talk to a judge and try and get him or her to step down. He threatened to get your job. Judge Mead could make intemperate comments. I learned not to take them seriously. In the car, Turner said, Thank you, Richard Nixon. Their car radio crackled with their name on it. I got a message for Turner says here to meet a guy named Hume. He's at some place called the Gay Tribune. And he says it's important. He must have our witness, Turner said. We need to look into these judges, Fenwick said. A hot bed of dissent right in front of us. My, this is our killer radar. It hasn't gone off yet. When did you get yours installed? Crew others had one and I was jealous. 
a gay mysteries audiobooks. I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.